This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. And I'm Dahlia Shenlin. Every week we interview authors of books and studies and other things that we find interesting. If you like us, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can find out about us on, on our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Our guest today is Dan Shadour. He is a terrific documentary filmmaker, the second filmmaker we've had in recently. He has turned out three films so far, including a great one called Before the Revolution about Israelis in Iran on the eve of the Islamic Revolution. We love that film, but we're going to be talking about his more recent film from 2018 simply because it is evergreen. It's so relevant. There's only one topic that never goes out of style in Israel, and that's King Bibi which is also the name of the film, King Bibi, The Life and Performances of Benjamin Netanyahu. This film has been shown in numerous international film festivals. It's won prizes or mentions at many of them. It has received great reviews from critics ranging from Der Spiegel to The Washington Post and many in between. And so we're very happy to have Dan Shadur with us on the show. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. Great. Dan, I want to start by locating this film in time. It appeared actually two years ago in 2018. And of course, you started working on it a few years before that. Maybe you can tell us when. Proper disclosure, I might have known something about it while it was under production. (laughs) Um, I want to know if anything has changed. I mean, it's been a very chaotic and cataclysmic two years. These are not any two years, I think. Do you think that anything about Netanyahu's personality, leadership, uh, what he represents has changed since that film appeared? Uh, definitely, yes, uh, changed uh, for the for the worse. I would say. Uh, um, I think the last uh, two years uh, were uh, like another chapter uh, that is still being written uh, every day. Um, and I mean, when when we were finishing the editing of the film at the, the end of 2018, uh, the first elections of uh, 2019 were announced. And we felt pretty lucky. We said, oh, now it's like uh, <laughs> we have a film that will be relevant for the election. And uh, little did we know that this uh, election will last uh, two years. And uh, I really don't see an end to it. I don't think the, the approaching election... And two is, years uh, on, it's still relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it was uh, kind of uh, uh, um, fortunate for us, less fortunate uh, for... <laughs> For, for Israel and, uh, and Israelis. Um, but yeah, I started working on the film uh, um, around 2015. The idea actually came to me in the US. Uh, I was traveling with my previous film, Before the Revolution, that you mentioned before, uh, about Israelis in Iran in the 1970s. Um, and I started noticing uh, Netanyahu appearances in the US media. And his image uh, started to intrigue me. Um, I never voted for him. uh, And uh, back in the day, I hardly knew anyone who voted for him. And yet he kept being uh, re-elected. And uh, uh, I I wanted to to understand uh, why. Um, And uh, another thing, he he intrigued me as a cinematic figure, not only as a political figure. And I was uh, eager to try and uh, make a documentary about him also because there was nothing about him uh, at the time there was at the time I, I mean since then there were two biographies published uh a great one by Angel Pfeffer. And, uh, <gasps> we wouldn't know anything about that, but we, <laughs> that we do. Of course, no, 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 we, we had, had him, him on. on the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, another one by Ben Caspit. But uh, at the time, there were uh, two uh, uh, biographies from the 90s and there were no documentaries. Um, the question when you come to make a documentary is all, always the, the first question you ask yourself as a filmmaker. And the, the, the question that the financiers and broadcasters ask you is, what is your access? I mean, how are you going to tell the story? And of course, uh, not only that I didn't have any access to Netanyahu, I knew I wouldn't have any. And at the time, and since then, he wasn't even speaking to the Israeli media. So there was a big uh, uh, question mark about that. At the same time, there was a f- there were a few uh, films released uh, that were based uh, solely on archival footage. Uh, there were the Amy about Amy Winehouse, uh, Senna, uh, by the same director about the uh, the Brazilian uh, driver. And a few years earlier, there was a magnificent uh, uh, and uh, uh, not easy to watch a documentary about uh, Ceausescu, uh, the autobiography of uh, Nicolae Ceausescu, which was uh, based solely on archival footage. Uh, three hours of uh, archival footage of Ceausescu. Who wouldn't want to watch three hours of Ceausescu? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's a masterpiece. Uh, and when I watched this film, the, it, it was kind of the Eureka moment saying, well, this is 
how you do the film about Netanyahu. And is that because you're comparing him to Ceausescu? No. <laughs> no, but I, I do want to ask you, what did you think was cinematic about him? I think it's this, on a, on a very uh, um, instinctive uh, level, it was this thing that I don't agree with uh, anything he says or represents, and yet I'm fascinated by him, I'm fascinated by his performances, and as someone who grew up uh, uh, in the 80s and, and 90s, um, I suddenly realized that there are so many of these performances over the years, uh, and I was saying, uh, why won't we just take these performances put them together and uh, see what what happens um and uh, and and there was another thing uh, being in the states and and thinking about this idea was his american persona um i always knew vaguely that he was connected to the us but only when i started researching i realized how deep this connection is Netanyahu actually spent almost half of his life until the age of 40 um, in the US. He was studying there in uh, as a child. He was he went to high school there. He went to uh, MIT and then he was a diplomat in uh, in DC all throughout uh, the the 80s. So uh, he was he was kind of an an American, the most successful Israeli politician of our time. Is uh, in in many ways. Uh, an American, so I, I really wanted to uh, to research this uh, this thing uh, um, as well, because um, uh, this was another uh, fascinating uh, aspect. And then, and doing the research, I mean, the the film had like two lines of uh, of two main lines of research. One was um, understanding the story and going to places and talking to people. And uh, um, I went to his high school in Cheltenham, Philadelphia, near Philadelphia, and uh, met his one of his teachers and met a lot of people in DC that were uh, uh, that that knew him, etc. And in Israel, of course. And the other thing was what you see in the film is the archival footage. Is going to the archives. Is looking for the uh, uh, moments that I mean. I, I guess that there are moments in the eighties just when he was studying or before that, where we might see a different Netanyahu than we know, less accomplished, less polished. Uh, um, how did he become this, uh, this persona um, that is so uh, uh, controlled? Um, and luckily, we did find some footage. Uh, um, there's a the part in the film, uh, since we're, we're in an audio uh, medium <laughs> right now, we can't see it, but uh, there's a part uh, uh, from the... Uh, Mid '80s, he goes to an interview in uh, in uh, um, some uh, American network, and I somehow found the tape of the raw footage uh, material. And you see him rehearse. You see him like starting telling a story about the grizzly bear and then uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, analog that he's, he's doing to that the... That is a uh, great moment because he yeah. tries to get it right. And he, he tries to get it right and he falters and he falters and falters and then he gets it, he gets it right. So this, is another, this was another Eureka moment for me when I said, okay, now I can... It's not just an idea. I can I can and, start and there's telling another the story. scene from the <clears throat> sorry from the from the early eighties where he's the spokesperson of the Israeli embassy in America when he goes out to the press to talk about to give a statement about the Lebanon war and he looks tired and disheveled and unshaved and I say is that the same Netanyahu that we know today? So that actually brings me to my question to you. Many people uh, who were once his close collaborators and have now turned. Uh, to be his uh, sworn enemies like uh, Moshe Yalon or Ehud Barak or Tsipi Livni talk about 2015 as a watershed moment. That, you know, Bibi until then is not the Bibi that we know since then. Do you subscribe to that theory or, you know, having studied Netanyahu over the years, do you see, like, li- you know, uh, uh, the little, uh, um, you know, the budding Netanyahu of today in the early Netanyahu that you saw? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I think 2015 is, a, is an important moment when he understands that he, he does everything alone and, and that he needs to stick to his most uh, radical and populist base. Um, so this is true. But while I was working on the film and uh, w- um, gathering footage, especially from his first uh, term in the 90s, it was amazing to see how all these elements were already there. I mean, the, the, the idea... and and. This is not only speaking about Netanyahu. This is speaking about populist leaders in general around the world. A lot of the methods we later saw uh, uh, Trump using or uh, the Brazilian president or, or others, you saw Netanyahu implement 
already in the in the 90s uh, when you look at his uh, winning rally in 96 uh, where the thousands of people are uh, gathering to uh, um, to support him um, and he gives the speech you see signs in the crowd against the leftist media so this is kind of you know go 20 years later you see trump uh, um, trump supporters uh, mm-hmm. holding the same uh, signs um, there was another uh, I don't know if if I can say beautiful uh, in this in this film. I mean, I, I try to make uh, beautiful things in in this film. It was a little bit different, but I found the the footage when he launches the uh, um, the first uh, website of the prime minister's office in 1997, and he records a video. I still don't know why, because there was no streaming at the time. But he records a video and he uh, congratulates the 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 first. Uh, visitors of the web- website and the text there is amazing he says from now on i'm, I'm speaking uh, freely and uh, from now on we can talk uh, directly. directly we don't need any commentators we don't need anyone to come between us you can learn the truth from me directly but th- this actually relates back to well two points that are part of the same theme one is that it not only goes back 20 years before trump i mean you refer to a point about the general resentment of the israeli elites including the media for the perception that they had kind of not accepted or promoted his father and they called them vultures in their family what was, what did the vultures refer to and how far back did that go um, i mean this is really deep rooted yeah, it's well. This this goes. Uh, uh, we'll have to bring uh, Anshel uh, again. <laughs> to <laughs> speak. Yeah, this goes very very deep uh, uh, to his uh, uh, um, to his uh, father Ben Zion and uh, his position, his political uh, position, um, and him being a, a very right wing uh, politician. And even Netanyahu's grandfather was uh, um, maybe less right wing, but he was a, a kind of a politician uh, as well. So he was uh, he grew up on on this, and he was. Uh, he grew up on the family being uh, kind of an outcast and being uh, attacked by the what they call the Bolsheviks, uh, a word that is uh, very meaningful and uh, has a lot of, uh, uh, they're very passionate about it. And he uh, still and, uses it today to, yes, to slander the Israeli media. He calls them Bolsheviks. I think what was interesting for me to discover and what uh, aroused some anger from uh, leftist critics uh, towards the film, that there was a certain truth to it. When I was looking at the... Uh, at the, how the media treated Netanyahu from the beginning, there was a certain, a certain resentment, there was a certain uh, arrogance, there was a certain uh, feeling of, you're not one of us. Um, you're, 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 you're different. And, uh, because he was American? I think a lot of it was about him being uh, American, but also him being uh, right-wing. I mean, let's be frank. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 uh, we're talking about days where the, the Israeli media was uh, very uh, left-wing uh, oriented. Um, so there is, like everything with Netanyahu, there is some truth in what he's saying. But the way he abuses this, the way he uses it, instead of uh, trying to find ways to reconcile and trying to find ways to bring people together, it really became a political uh, tool for him. And again, we're jumping to 2015. Ever since then, this was really uh, um, something he kept uh, using uh, in a very aggressive uh, way until the point where we saw uh, um, signs. Uh, when was that? That was part of one of the elections, the the signs with the uh, ben Kaspit and Raviv Drucker and oh, the guy Peleg on the... the big journalists saying yeah. they will not decide you will yeah, address yeah. the voter yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 yeah I mean you, I don't think he can claim now that the media is against him he controls uh, so many elements of it and he controls the, the discourse uh, but this today. is what I want to ask you because you actually start the film like in the very beginning by pointing out that he never gives or rarely gives direct interviews to the media and I think that I can't you know I've seen the film before but re- preparing for this I I really noticed the prominence of that point at the very beginning and it made an impression because we forget that he doesn't give interviews he's omnipresent he's everywhere he's in every headline he dominates social media he dominates uh, the agenda he gives press conferences all the time but then just the penny dropped that we've become so accustomed to the fact that it is a one way conversation. Yeah. What do you, effect do you think that has on the discourse? No, Nobody's the, the, ever able to challenge him. But the more interesting thing about it, if I may, is you that you know, when you see him in the early days giving interviews, and he gave many, he did it so well. So, you know, it's kind of paradoxical in a way. Yeah. Because he could manipulate the media and the interviewer so well, so why not do it? 
Because <laughs> I think this is part of his cynicism. Because he 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 can he can give interviews today. He can speak. He can he can say interesting things as well. Um, he's an intelligent uh, <laughs> guy. But this is really tools that that he uses. He knows that this. Um, um the sentiment uh, against the media is something that really benefits him uh, politically and i think another thing after 2015 another turning point was 2016 and uh, trump that uh, we are on this day uh, um, recording saying this, this <laughs> yeah yep. uh, saying goodbye to trump saying goodbye to to trump i think this gave him uh, uh, another boost and another push to uh, to go in this direction and to really uh, um, abuse this uh, toxic uh, uh, relationship and uh, sentiment and uh, what is uh, sad is that the israeli media is uh, letting him do it is is kind of uh, is 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 falling in all these traps uh, what could the they do differently um generally speaking be uh, less uh, shallow and uh, more uh, thoughtful and yeah. uh, serious let's not go down that route. <laughs> yeah, okay <laughs> <laughs> I, i want to ask you another thing the main thesis or one of the main theses in in the film is that bibi reinvented himself as a media golden boy thanks to lillian wilder who uh, was a public speaking guru who mentored him in his uh, early days in politics. Now, can, can you tell us about how you came across her work and the tapes that feature you know, of her speaking, the instructions? Uh, um, you know, where, where, how, how, how did you get, uh, get access to it? And when did that, uh, the, the penny drop? When, when did the thesis uh, um, started making sense? As in, you know, this is, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, so Lillian Wilder is a, a fascinating character uh, herself. Um, her name was mentioned in, in his early biographies um, and uh, in some of the first articles about Netanyahu when he became prime minister or ran for prime minister uh, in the 90s. And I was intrigued by this story. I was intrigued by her name and I started uh, studying uh, about her. Um, she was actually a student of uh, Lee Strasberg in uh, New York uh, in the 50s and she was studying with Marlon Brando and James Dean and uh, she wanted to to be an actress. Uh, she realized uh, pretty early on that she's not going to be a, a, a great actress, but she was very talented and she used this talent to become a, a very famous uh, speech instructor and uh, she w- she worked with a lot of uh, uh, businessmen like uh, Ron Lauder and politicians including uh, um, George Bush and, uh, and others. Um, and um, And she met net and she was also uh, uh, Jewish and and very uh, Zionist uh, she met Netanyahu in the 80s um, and uh, and she instructed him I mean she ga- she gave him a few lessons and Netanyahu actually in one of his responses to the film said that he only met her uh, once or or twice and that the only thing she told him is uh, only say the truth and Um, what she that didn't said very well what, what she said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah what she said uh, on her deathbed as I learned uh, later is that he was her best student uh, ever um, <laughs> so um, so she yeah. undermined his his uh, his point well, it's not you know, I'm not gonna take a position you know. here by saying but, but, that but he was do, best do you really think that he's owing much of his media skills to her and her instruction I think so yes and I actually heard from a few of his advisors after watching the film uh, they came to me and they said he's he's still using it I mean he's still um, I mean I, I'm, I'm sure he's not coming with the tapes to interviews yeah, and uh, but that's his playbook yeah yeah mm-hmm. I mean they feel that that it, it there was something very uh, very uh, accurate uh, about it and uh, and I think it's uh, true I think he really uh, learned something there and uh, and understood it and uh, and I understand why she said he was her best student because I also during the research I spoke with people who worked on uh, um, um, political ads with him uh, and they say he's he's memorizing texts on the on the one take he understand the text immediately he understand the editing he gives um, um, gives notes editing notes yeah I think that I, I've for, heard from political consultants yeah. who've worked uh, with BB that it's beyond just memorizing them that he, he is micromanaging them he gets involved in rewriting the script yeah yeah Yes. at that level which is for people who are not inside campaigns that's a very very um, interventionist approach to campaign yeah so and this is interesting about Netanyahu because on one hand it does go to his biography and being the son of a historian I think the idea and the historian was very involved politically the idea of telling the narrative 
is something that he was really getting from early, early childhood, how important the narrative is. And I think it's something that he fully understood when his brother died. And there was, uh, they, were, they were fighting about the narrative of Yoni the hero from the, according to, to some people from Sayyid Matkal, they were uh, actively doing it during the, the Shiva. Um, so the, the idea of controlling the narrative was something that he grew up with and then understanding new media, understanding social media um, so uh, uh, deeply, this is, this is uh, part of his uh, talent. And while editing the film, the, we, we, we had the tapes, the Lillian Wilder tapes. I mean, this is part of a, we only used a few minutes of a three-hour uh, uh, instruction tape which is interesting to to listen to uh, regardless um and then came the idea to to kind of weave it in the editing and use it as, as something that reoccurs in the film because uh, this is the theme of the of of the film this is what we're talking about and this was i think the strength of the film and also something that um um brought us some criticism from from the left and from Netanyahu himself, because when Netanyahu watched the film, he said, in short, well, it's an interesting film, and of course he liked to watch himself. But, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Sure. but, but he also said that this is, I mean, I'm not this superficial uh, leader that is, uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ideological leader who brought a revolution to, to Israel, which is partly true, but we wanted to emphasize um, the superficial uh, aspect of it, and and this thing um, kept reoccurring. I mean, this this is this is still relevant. But I think what's interesting about it is that it, it isn't very superficial. In other words, it is a, a top layer of how you communicate. But now we know from the Trump era onward, and even before that, that it has tapped into a great global wave of populist leaders. In this era, we're looking mostly at right wing nationalist populists. And it taps into extremely deep social forces. So what I want to ask you is, you know, it is significant that we are recording this on the day that Donald Trump is leaving the White House and the inauguration of Joe Biden is happening. And I'm wondering, you know, if there is somehow a decline in the currency following the chaos of the Trump years and the devastation in America, if somehow the star of this national populism will decline as people become a little more critical and cynical of it, even though on the liberal side they always were, but will this somehow weaken the power of Netanyahu and other populist leaders to use this sort of worldview of big rallies, grievances, anti-elites, they're always trying to, you know, um, plot against me. I mean, could that somehow weaken at all following Trump's departure? If it will weaken the, the populist movement in general, we'll have to wait and see. I, I doubt it because I think these forces exist and I think this, um, uh, this hidden uh, um, tie between uh, these leaders and the media, it still exists. I mean, aren't we missing Trump already a little bit? I mean, it's, um, it's going to really? be boring no. now. <laughs> Not really, no. But uh, I mean... In terms of you know opening yeah, the news yeah. and and getting the entertainment, um, I don't know how life will look without it, and I don't know what people will will look for and get uh, uh, um, instead of of getting this. And in terms of Netanyahu, uh, unfortunately uh, for everyone who would like to see another leader in Israel, he's much more sophisticated than Trump, and uh, he's much more uh, intelligent and knowledgeable, and he doesn't do the mistakes that uh, Trump did. So um, I don't know if it will affect uh, his reign in Israel. I want to go back to what you said earlier about uh, you know um, the bio two definitive biographies that came about about the same time came out about the same time as your movie, um, uh, Angel Pfeffer's and Ben Kaspitz, and it. They were published, the definitive biographies were published well into Netanyahu's political career, as, as well as your film, of yeah. course. You know, after he had been in politics, in the forefront of politics for 40 years, why do you think people started taking interest in Netanyahu so late into his career? That's a, that's a difficult uh, question. I think part of it is we are part of this media that always looked down on Netanyahu. And I think, in a way, uh, many people in the media 
were just waiting for him to go, <laughs> like, <laughs> waiting for this phenomenon to disappear, and uh, always saying, "Now is it, it's still you, you can still see it. Now is now is gone. Now is done. Now is." Uh, But I also hear the opposite. Actually, I hear some of the you know uh, in the know commentators now saying, "Oh my gosh, he's going to sweep the elections this time," which is true because a lot of times, I mean, what you're saying is true. In previous cycles, every commentator thinks they know for sure this is his downfall. So, yeah. And and another aspect of it is is very uh, simple. When I first came to the broadcaster with this the, with the idea, they told me, "Why the hell would we want to see Netanyahu for ninety minutes? We see him on the news every every day. I mean, we we don't want to we don't want to see it." So I think uh, we kind of went. Past this hurdle, we understood that he's here to stay. We understood that he represents something uh, uh, deeper than himself, something deep about Israeli society, and that he, he is the the most prominent political figure of our time. And it's time to deal with it and to to try and uh, to try and tell this uh, story. So I guess uh, me and uh, Ben and Angel felt kind of uh, the same way uh, at the same time. It was kind of the part of the, the zeitgeist. Going back to Lillian Wilder and his uh, media skills and what we said about the early footage that you found of his, of his interviews, that he was, you know, a lot more relatable than he is today. He had, you know, self-deprecating humor, he, you know, I found him a lot more charming and I was surprised at, you know, having forgotten how charming he was and could be yeah. rather than, you know, the sort of morose, arrogant, aggressive person that he is today with a huge chip on his shoulder. <laughs> and um, Lillian Wilder kept saying, you know, you, you've got to reach out to your audience to be more relatable. And he's gone in in the different direction. Yeah. But... It, it pays off. He's a lot more popular today than he was then. What do you have to say about that? I don't know if he's a lot more popular today. He's still like, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's using the Israeli political uh, system very uh, wisely. But, you know, in 96, he won by a margin of a few 10,000 uh, votes. He still doesn't have this vast uh, majority. Every election he has to... Uh, no, his, uh, his ratings are very stable at 41, 42% positive rating, approval rating, which yeah. is very similar to Donald Trump, by the way. Yeah, his so... His average was 41% over four years. Um, but... Um, The empathetic is he more popular now? No, I. I mean, this is. I mean, the story is the the classical Shakespearean story. It's what uh, power does to you, and this was uh, another decision we took in editing, because there was, you know, we went into the editing room with all this footage. Usually, when you make a film, you have interviews, you have like, uh, you have a certain structure, you have scenes. We had nothing. We only had these bits and pieces, and we needed to to tell a story uh, with this. And there was, uh, uh, we tried at certain points to approach it thematically. Um, to 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 address certain topics, and then you can use footage from different times and mix it together. But then we felt that we're losing something significant, and this is exactly this: the change, what happened to his to his face, to his persona over the years. And we decided to keep it chronological because uh, we felt that this is the feeling that you get during. This is the arc of the film: is some someone that is uh, uh, very bright, very young, very good looking. You have the Rivka Michaeli interview from 1987, the, the first his first talk show in Israeli TV with his open button, uh, with this smile that you don't see anymore. Something very human, very. Uh, it, like, it was somewhat embarrassed, even. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a little it's, shy. A little shy, a little. But I would like, like to say, for the record, you have an open top button on your shirt. <laughs> I mean, it's very Israeli, and it used okay, to be standard yeah. uniform. King, King yeah. Dan. King Dan. <laughs> I want to ask you another thing about uh, uh, his... Um... No, but oh, yeah, I will just end it by saying that for me, this is part of the, the tragedy of Netanyahu because, I mean, the, the way I see it at least, he, he's a very capable uh, man. He has a lot of... He, he could have done, uh, I think, great things in Israel with his uh, ability and his, with his talent, but he chose to... Uh, but I mean, in his, ways. you know, as we say, in his yeah. mind, yeah. he has done great things for Israel and apparently in the minds of 27% of the voters. Yeah, we'll keep voting for him. Yeah, yeah. well, we, we can't argue. Yeah, with that, that. That's part of the complexity of his yeah. uh, of his persona. Um, did do you know anything about whether he knew that you were working on this movie, or, or you know, before and after? Did did he try to reach out, or, or you know, even influence the uh, the editing process, or or and and after the film was released, did he? Other than the statement that you mentioned, uh, did he send any signs through? You know, even indirectly. 
Um, so while working on the film, this was part of the idea of not interviewing anyone, just using the footage, is, was that we were completely under the radar. So this was, I, 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 we, we weren't dependent uh, on anyone uh, to make the film. We, only, we had the footage and we could do uh, whatever we could, uh, w- whatever we wanted with that. So uh, there was no uh, real contact. We contacted him uh, um, when we were approaching the end of the editing and we uh, asked to interview him and we didn't get an answer. Um, after the film was out and after a few months um, that it was broadcast in yes and it w- it had a lot of screenings and it and, and it made quite a noise in uh, in Israel then he he gave this uh, comment he was uh, watching the film on the way to Chad uh, <laughs> oh so just recently actually because that wasn't so long ago no this was uh, like was two years two ago, years ago. Yeah. it's already it was, uh, two years ago when he went it was before the election in April of 2019 yeah I think it, it was, was in the be- summer of 2019. It, it oh, no. was March, I think, 2018. Oh. The, the film was the, the film okay. premiered in the Jerusalem Film Festival at the end of two, 2018, but it actually was broadcast in the early 2019, right. and that's when the, the big debate about it uh, started. Yeah, and then he gave his uh, his uh, response uh, to Tal Shalev. But it was a public response. It wasn't to you or no, no, not one. not personally. No, yeah. on on the eve of the broadcast, I got a phone call from this number of you know like uh, seven like this uh, VIP number, and I was like, oh, who is this? But it was someone. Else. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out it was a cable company trying to get you to subscribe. No, right? no, it was it was uh, someone that watched the film, but it wasn't uh, Netanyahu. Um, but he gave this response that uh, where, where he said that uh, he watched the film; it was an interesting film. That he fell asleep in the middle, <laughs> but not because it's not good, but because he was very tired, too busy saving the country, which yeah, is what he likes yeah. to talk about he, all the time. He, it was a very, it was a typical Netanyahu uh, response in the way that uh, uh, it was very like uh, uh, some were dismissed you know yeah. humiliating Passive a little aggressive. bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly he later gave another response when the film was uh, later it was firstly broadcast by Yes Doku who commissioned the film and then it was bought by Reshet and it was uh, broadcast there again another and then he tweeted program. that uh, uh, a more aggressive uh, mm. <laughs> tweet that it's strange that the creators of uh, King Bibi didn't show uh, uh, um, him uh, saying that Rabin is not a traitor. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, I later learned that he didn't like the film. I thought that he was like kind of uh, ambivalent uh, about it. I later, I later learned that, uh, and this is again to show how smart he is. He didn't like the film, but he knew that if, if he will turn against the film, it will only help us. So he gave this uh, response that was uh, more uh, mild. <laughs> oh, there's so much to talk about. Yeah. I mean, he is such a big part of our lives. But I want to talk about something that oddly we haven't raised at all yet, which is. You know, I know I'm dating my age here, but I mean, I grew up under the sort of myth of Yoni Netanyahu. There was no Bibi when I was growing up. Nobody knew about him. And he sort of burst into the scene, sort of political consciousness of Israelis in the early 90s. But Yoni was, of course, a towering influence in his life. And can you talk about kind of what Yoni meant to him before he was killed and then after his death? I mean, you did speak about trying to manage Yoni's narrative. But how did it affect who Netanyahu became? It had a great effect. They were very close, very, very uh, close. I heard uh, this, uh, there, there were so many stories that I heard and couldn't put in the film because it's, it wasn't in the footage, but I heard a fascinating story from uh, one of uh, Bibi's uh, comrades in Sayat Matkal. And he was saying We should that, just say that's the elite commando yes. unit where they both served. Yes. yes. Um, it, well, um, Yoni was the commander when he was uh, killed in uh, Antebbe. Uh, and he said that Bibi was very uh, politically oriented since always. Like he always calculated what needs to happen, but it was about Yoni at the time. He always calculated what has to happen in the unit so Yoni will take command. It wasn't about himself. And then when, and, and we know that Ben Zion, the father, was, he destined Yoni to be the, the leader. And we have it in the film that he says that Yoni was the leader. Yoni was the, the guy. And this is, that's another psychological aspect that, you know. Um, but, uh, um, but he was, and, and, and when Yoni is, is killed, then Bibi has the, the stage. He was already politically active uh, before. Um, he was studying a business in uh, MIT, actually architecture and business. 
Um, and then uh, when he graduated, he went to work for the Boston uh, Consultant Group, uh, where he worked alongside Mitt Romney for a second. And he he saw himself as a as a businessman. But at the same time, he started speaking and uh, he started uh, advocating for for Israel. And after Yoni died, his stage became um, much bigger because of uh, Yoni's persona and his talent. Uh, Sure. Every, everybody could could see his talent and and that's where he, uh, his career launched yeah well you know uh just to say um you know to quote basil faulty who said i could spend the rest of my life having this conversation <laughs> so i could as well we've got so, there's so much to uh, uh to cover here but because we are r- running out of time i'd like to ask you perhaps a um uh, a wrap-up question yeah um your a colleague of yours uh, uh avi mogul be another israeli documentary film like uh, made many years ago, a film called uh, How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Ariel Sharon. It was a good film, yeah. actually. I remember it. And I, I wanted to ask you whether King Baby was for you How I Stopped Worrying and Started Loving Benjamin Netanyahu. I, I do want to add to that because it's such a good question. I mean, you had to live with him in your mind for four years, three years. Did that have any impact on you? Yeah, did you feel did, like you could did, conjure did, him in discover a Discover like other uh, unknown should, aspects of his should, very complex personality? You, you should talk to my wife about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I would phrase it like this. Maybe I started loving him, but I didn't stop boring. So <laughs> <laughs> it just made me... Uh, well, a, again, one of the first uh, cuts that we made, uh, it started out as Bibi the cynicist, the liar, the, 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 the ruthless politician. And, and we saw that it, it wasn't interesting. I mean, it wasn't interesting starting with, with, with what so many people think and know. And it was a very big challenge for us. We're going back to what we talked about uh, earlier in the editing room to create this empathic uh, uh, young politician at the beginning. So this is something I had to do in the editing room. This is something as a filmmaker, you you want your, your character to be interesting. Um, so this is something that I had to, went to, to go through. Um, I did learn, I wouldn't say to like him. He became a much more complex figure for him, for me. And, he beca- and his supporters became much more complex for me. I understood much better why people vote for him, why people uh, uh, support uh, him. Again, this emphasized the tragedy for me at the end of the line. This emphasized the tragedy of all this talent, all these abilities, and what the hell are you doing with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always good to uh, produce something that deepens your thinking and makes the whole situation look more complex. I'm all for it. Dan Shadur, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And many thanks to Itai Shalem, our producer and sound engineer. And now a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we'd like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. You can say anything you want, freedom of speech. You can support us by going to our website, tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review, and by subscribing on our Patreon campaign. Check out our archives. We have over 600 interviews, and that's a lot of interviews. Like us on Facebook. Follow me and Gilad on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. <laughs>